good morning everyone back again gonna go through the first fuel systems lecture real quick with you try to get you a little more information as I continue to work on my YouTube video uploading game <clears throat> um, chapter 14 in the 8083 and chapter 15 in the Jepson that's what we're gonna be looking at today it covers this initial fuel systems material first we're gonna look at the purpose of our fuel system obviously we need to store the fuel and we need to deliver the fuel where it needs to go these are the two main purposes of the fuel system hopefully that's pretty self-explanatory and obvious to you we need to make sure that the system is reasonably free from a tendency to vapor lock back in materials and processes we talked about bending and making fabricating fuel lines and we talked that we want to avoid sharp turns and bends right sharp turns and bends are going to allow places um, for vapor to collect and it's going to make vapor lock issues much worse again vapor lock that's where we get fuel vapor displacing or blocking the liquid fuel from traveling through the system to where it needs to go the aircraft fuel system must ensure positive and reliable fuel flow throughout all phases of flight. So if I add power, I remove power, accelerate or decelerate, um, violently banking up and down uh, pitch attitude changes, I've got to ensure that that fuel flow is going to be uninterrupted. Now, does this necessarily mean I can fly inverted and I won't have interrupted fuel flow no that is not the case obviously we're gonna to have to have more components if we're going to be trying to do aerobatic flight maneuvers the simplest type of fuel system is the gravity feed fuel system okay in this system we don't have a pump we rely on the force of gravity to push essentially our fuel from the storage tank down through our lines and get it where we need to go into the engine, obviously, uh, at the end. We're gonna have a few necessary components. We're gonna have to have an outlet strainer in the tank, right? We don't want to send debris to our fuel system. We're gonna need a shutoff valve, right? We want to be able to cut fuel flow to the engine. We're gonna need a fuel strainer or a filter a primer system and that will complete our path to the carburetor so we got a Cessna 150 here with its fuel system schematic there you can see we have two interconnected tanks a shutoff valve a strainer and drain a primer pump and that's it very very basic fuel system not a lot to go wrong there next we have the Cessna Ag Wagon and we get a little bit more complicated here we have our fuel tank. You can see that expansion space up top. We gotta allow a certain amount of space for the fuel to be able to expand as it reacts to temperature changes. We have a fuel shutoff valve. Again, we gotta be able to cut fuel flow to the engine, correct? We have our fuel strainer and drain. Again, a primer. And then you can see where we go to our carburetor on into the engine cylinders. On this ag wagon, you can see we have an electrical fuel quantity indicator. We've got our outlet screen from the tank. And we have mechanical linkage to control our shutoff valve, our strain, uh, our strainer drain knob, and our throttle lever and our mixture control. Obviously, that's how we're going to control fuel flow to the engines. In gravity systems, the fuel flow rate of uh, must be 100 for 150 excuse me percent of the takeoff fuel consumption of the engine and you'll see as we get um, into uh, pump systems systems that use a fuel pump that number is going to come down why is that well if we're using gravity we want to ensure we always have plenty of fuel available so in a gravity system we need to be able to supply 150 percent of the takeoff fuel consumption of the engine the total usable capacity of the fuel tanks must be enough for at least one half hour of operation at 
max continuous power, right? So these are from the FAR, it's 23.963. This is a rule laid down by the FAA. We also need each fuel tank to have expansion space, not less than 2% of the tank capacity. Again, we know that fuel is going to react to temperature changes. We have to give space for expansion. And it must be impossible to fill the expansion space inadvertently with the airplane in the normal ground attitude. Typically, this is going to dictate where our filling point goes. We want to have our filling point in a spot where it will not allow us to overfill the tanks and fill up this expansion space. Fuel tank vents. Why do we need our fuel tanks vented to the atmosphere? Right? Well, obviously, if we don't have a vent from the fuel tank to the atmosphere, what is going to happen to our fuel flow? As fuel leaves the tank, we're going to create a partial vacuum. That is going to cut our fuel flow rate drastically. So we always need our tanks vented to the atmosphere. <clears throat> Tanks are normally vented to the atmosphere, which allows atmospheric pressure outside the tank and the air pressure in the tank to be the same. We don't want negative pressure in the tanks. That is going to hurt our fuel flow. Each, uh, each fuel tank must be able to withstand the following pressures without failure or leakage. For each conventional metal tank, so that's not an integral tank, a non-metallic tank, with uh, walls not supported by the airplane structure, so we're looking at bladder tanks here. A pressure of 3.5 psi, or that pressure developed during maximum ultimate acceleration with a fuel, uh, with a full fuel tank, whichever is greater. So we've got to be able to withstand a little bit of positive pressure, not negative pressure, but positive pressure in the tank without leaking. That makes sense. No fuel tank may be uh, on the engine side of the firewall. Well, that makes sense. Why would we not want a fuel tank on the engine side of a firewall? Well, if we have an engine fire, our fuel tank is going to be there, and it's going to make the fire much worse if we have a fuel tank sitting there. The whole point of a firewall is to keep all that forward of our fuel tanks, our passenger compartments, etc. So we need at least one half inch clearance between the fuel tank and the firewall. And obviously the fuel tank is going to be on the opposite side of the firewall as the engine. Skipping along here real quick, looking for things in red. At least two vents arranged to minimize the probability of both vents becoming obstructed simultaneously. This is if a single fuel tank or series of fuel tanks interconnected to function as a single tank is used on a multi-engine airplane. So we may have multiple fuel tanks, but they're interconnected. So in practice, they act like a single tank. So we need two vents. Well, why do we need two vents? We need redundancy. If one of the, ten, uh, one of the tank vents is obstructed, we want to have another one. We don't want one blocked vent to compromise our fuel flow. We also need a fuel strainer for the fuel tank outlet or for the booster pump. So as fuel leaves the storage tank, we don't want to take any contaminants with it. So we have a strainer at the outlet of the tank. For reciprocating engine powered airplanes, it must have eight to 16 meshes per inch. So the FAA is very specific about what is required for these fuel tank outlet strainers. The diameter of each strainer must be at least that of the fuel tank outlet. So the diameters have to be at least equal. And the clear area of each fuel tank outlet strainer must be at least five times the area of the outlet line. Hmm. So whatever time area the outlet line has, we need five times that for the area of our fuel tank strainer. There's a couple different ways we can manipulate that as far as making the diameter larger or making the outlet strainer longer, but we need that amount of area. Continue on 23.995, no engine sh or no shutoff valve may be on the engine side of any firewall. 
Well, if you think about it, typically during flight, we're not gonna access the engine side of a firewall. So what good is a shutoff valve going to do us if we can only manipulate it, we can only shut off fuel flow from the engine side of the firewall? That basically means it can only be shut off on the ground. That's not gonna do us a lot of good in the air if we have an engine fire. We need to be able to shut off fuel flow. If we have an engine fire, we cut fuel flow, we're gonna cut fuel to that fire. Hopefully it will extinguish. Fuel selectors, right? In multi-tank systems, we're gonna have an off position, we may have a left position, we may have a right position, and we will have a both position. Obviously both, we're gonna be pulling from both tanks, or we can select left and right individually. We can also set it to the off position. The positions of the different detents matter too. We have to have the selector positions located in such a manner that it's impossible for the selector to pass through the off position when changing from one tank to another. So I can't have, bear with me really quick, so here we're selecting to both tanks. This position we're selecting the left tank. Vertical position we're selecting off. Over here, we're selecting right. Notice if I wanna switch from the right tank to the left tank, I've gotta pass through the off position. This is not allowed. Typically, we want both left, right, off. Off is gonna to be to either side because we can't pass through the off position in order to select a single tank or both tanks. There must be a fuel strainer or filter between the fuel tank outlet and the inlet of either the fuel metering device or an engine driven positive displacement pump, whichever is near the fuel tank outlet. This fuel strainer must be accessible for draining and cleaning and must incorporate a screen or element which is easily removable. We need a sediment trap and a drain. If the sediment trap is easily removable, we don't need a separate drain. We can use that as our drain, but we need a place typically in the lowest part of the system, to drain out contaminants. In addition, for commuter category airplanes, unless means are provided in the fuel system to prevent the accumulation of ice on the filter, a means must be provided to automatically maintain fuel flow if ice, clogging, if ice clogs the filter. So typically this is just going to be a bypass. Once the filter becomes clogged, we will have a bypass path for it to travel around the filter and continue going to its destination. We can't have a single clogged filter compromise our fuel flow. Again, this strainer needs to be in the lowest part of the system because we looked at water and fuel samples before and what did the water do when it's in the fuel? It collects at the lowest point. Therefore, the strainer has to be in the lowest part of the system. There must be at least one drain to allow safe drainage of the entire fuel system with the airplane in its normal ground attitude. Now, this is going to be usable fuel. We know that there is unusable fuel in the aircraft as well. The drain does not necessarily have to allow for draining of that unusable fuel. The drain valve has to have a manual or automatic means for positive locking in the closed position. We need a detent. We need it to stick in that possession. We need it to be readily accessible. It can be easily open and closed, and it allows for the fuel to be caught for examination. We did this way back in ground ops, where you went to the fuel strainer and you took a sample and you inspected that sample. We also have to make sure that it can be properly and positively closed. Fuel quantity indicators, there must be a means to indicate to the flight crew members the quantity of usable fuel in the tank during each flight, right? We want the fuel quantity indicator to show zero when we have depleted our usable fuel. Would it do any good to have it only show zero on the quantity indicator when we've reached um, the point where we've drained all our fuel, including unusable fuel? No, because I'm gonna be showing an eighth of a tank and my engine's gonna quit because we have starved our usable fuel supply. So it needs to show zero when we've reached 
the end of our usable fuel. Hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> Each fuel quantity indicator must be adjusted as specified in 23.1337B to account for unusable fuel supply. Again, and it's going to be under a test performed uh, in uh, accordance with 23.959A. Each fuel quantity indicator must be calibrated to read zero during level flight when the quantity of fuel remaining in the tank is equal to the unusable fuel supply. Right, so when we only have unusable fuel, we want the tank to show zero. Each fuel tank must have a drainable sump with an effective capacity in the normal ground in flight attitudes of 0.25% of the tank capacity or 1 16th of a gallon, whichever is greater. So we've got to have at least that capacity in our drainable sump. If a fuel flow metering system is installed, each metering component must have a means to bypass the fuel supply if malfunctioning of that component severely restricts fuel flow. So here we have fuel flow indicators. These are very common on large aircraft. It's going to tell us how much fuel is flowing. Now, if this uses a vane type mechanism, if that fuel flow indicator locks up, we need to have provisions for that fuel to be able to bypass it. Again, we don't want a fuel flow indicator malfunction to starve uh, fuel to our engine, right? That will not do. We need redundancy. Here we look at a pressure or a pump fed fuel system. This goes back to the gravity system providing 150% of take off power fuel usage. Now we have a pump in the system. We only need to meet 125% of the fuel flow required by the engine at max takeoff power. Now we have those pumps. They're providing more of a positive flow. So that number is going to come down. Emergency pumps. For each hand operated pump, this rate must occur at no more than 60 complete cycles, 120 single strokes per minute. So our hand operated emergency pump has uh, fuel flow levels that it has to meet as too. We have to be able to meet that 125% number in 60 complete cycles, which means a cycle, obviously, an upstroke and a downstroke. We'll look at the wobble pump when we get back into face-to-face -face lecture, and you're going to see that with each individual stroke, we are having fuel output. Some, it takes a cycle, an up and a downstroke. In a wobble pump, the up and the downstroke both have fuel outlet. Now uh, we look at turbine engine fuel system installations. Each turbine engine fuel system must provide at least 100% of the fuel flow required by the engine under each intended operation condition and maneuver. So now in a turbine system, we're only having to meet that 100% number. For a pump system, it's 125% takeoff power for a gravity feed system it is 150 percent again as we go to simpler systems the required amount of fuel flow is going to go up because we want to make sure that we have plenty of fuel for that engine well that's about it for the first powerpoint i will be uploading more videos soon thank you for bearing with me when we come back to face-to-face -to -face class we will be taking our tests we will have reviews and we will take tests in the morning and do our practicals after the tests. We will also be going over helico uh, helicopter aerodynamics in class. Probably the first or second day we're back in in-person classes. This is a really complicated PowerPoint and a lot of the concepts are new to people. So I want to go through that in person. So if you're out there saying, hey, we never went through the helicopter aerodynamics PowerPoint. That is why we have not done that. Best of luck. Thanks for bearing with me here. Um, hope you have a great day. I'll talk to you later.